Welcome to the video help with physics problems for physics 1b. This video is going to cover homework set 0 which is a revision set. All the questions in this set are assumed knowledge for this course so make sure that you know how to do them. Problem 1. In this problem you have a resistor R with a resistance equal to 10 ohms. A light bulb with a resistance 5.0 ohms. And a battery with an output voltage of 12 volts. In part A, we're asked to draw a circuit diagram showing how you can connect the battery resistor and light bulb in series. So part A, we have our battery like this. We have a resistor here, we have a light bulb, and these are connected in series. There's only one way that the current can flow around the circuit. Part B says calculate the voltage drop across and current through the resistor and light bulb. In a series circuit, we have a constant current throughout the entire circuit. So the best way to approach this question is to start by working out the current for the circuit. So the total current in the circuit, using V is equal to IR, we have I is equal to the total voltage over the total resistance. And because these are in series, we know that to get the equivalent resistance, the total resistance, we just have to add the two resistances together. which gives us that the total current is equal to 12 over 15, which is equal to 0 0.8 amps. So that's the amount of current flowing through the resistor and also the amount of current flowing through the light bulb. Now what we need to do is work out the voltage drop across each of them. We can just use Ohm's law again. So the voltage drop across the resistor is equal to the current through the resistor, which is 0 0.8 amps times the 10 ohms, so that gives us 8 volts. Now to get the voltage drop across the light bulb, we could once again use Ohm's law, but probably a slightly faster way to do it is to realise that the total voltage drop across the circuit is 12. So if we do 12 minus 8 volts, that will give us the voltage drop across the light bulb here, so that is equal to 4.0 volts. So that's how we do part B. Part C says on your circuit diagram indicate where you would place a voltmeter and an ammeter to measure each of these quantities. Okay, so the voltmeter to measure VR would go here, that will measure the voltage across the resistor. The voltage to measure the voltage across the light bulb will go here. Voltmeters are always connected in parallel with the component that they're measuring. Now we can put the ammeter, it doesn't matter where, we can put it here or we can put it here. So let's just put an ammeter in here, and as the current's constant everywhere, that'll measure the current through both those resistors. So that's part C. Part D says calculate the power expended by the light bulb. Well, to calculate power, we can just use the equation P is equal to VI. So we need the voltage drop across the light bulb, which is equal to 4.0. And then we need the current through the light bulb, which is 0 0.8. And so this is equal to 3.2 watts. Part E of the question says, how much energy does the light bulb use in an hour? Well, energy is equal to power times time. So this is equal to 3.2 watts times 60 times 60. So solving that on the calculator, we end up with 11,520 joules, which is equal to 11, well, 12 kilojoules to two significant figures. Part F says, now draw a circuit diagram showing the battery, resistor and light bulb connected in parallel. Okay, here's our battery. We can put the light bulb there. And then one way to draw this in parallel is there's the resistor in parallel with the light bulb and the battery. And part G says calculate the voltage across the and current through the resistor and light bulb in this case. 
Well, in this case, we've got the same voltage across each of these, as this side's at 12 volts, this side's at 0 volts, so they've each got a voltage drop of 12 volts across them. So V is equal to 12.0 volts across both components. And now what we can do is use Ohm's law with each component to get the current through it. So the current through the light bulb is equal to the voltage drop across the light bulb over the resistance of the light bulb, which is equal to 12 over 5, which is equal to 2.4 amps. And the current through the resistor is equal to the voltage of the resistor over the resistance of the resistor, which is 12 over 10, which is 1.2 amps. And that's answered question one. Problem two. A piece of string with a small mass M attached to the end of it is tied to a truck in such a way that it hangs underneath. Let's draw a little sketch. So we've got a mass M here, we've got an angle theta here, the truck's accelerating in this direction, and we're told that the acceleration is equal to 5.0 meters per second per second. What angle does the string make with the underside of the truck? So we need to find out what theta is. So to do this question, we're going to need to consider all the forces which are acting on this mass M here. The forces acting on it are we've got the mg force acting downwards, and we've got the tension acting upwards. Now, these are the only two forces acting on it, and they should add together to give us the resultant force on this mass. As this mass is being accelerated, it is going to feel a resultant force. So let's add the tension and the weight force together using vectors. So we add them head to tail. We've got the tension, which is acting upwards like that and making an angle theta there. And then head to tail, here's our weight force, mg, acting down like that. And then when we add these two together, we get a resultant force acting in this direction from the tail of this one to the head of this one. And that is F resultant, which Newton's second law tells us must be equal to ma. So we know what the acceleration is. It's 5 meters per second per second, and we know what g is. So just using some geometry now, we know that if this angle is theta, this is 90 minus theta, that's 90. So this angle here is theta. And so we can write tan theta is equal to opposite, which is mg, over adjacent, which is ma. Our m's cancel out, and we have this is 9.8 over 5. And so we know that theta, solving this on the calculator, is equal to 63 degrees. And so we've solved that problem. Problem three. A rubber ball is dropped from a rest at a height h. Describe how the energy of the ball changes as the ball bounces up and down. With reference to energy, explain why the ball does not bounce as high on subsequent bounces as it does on the first. You should use a graph and some equations in your explanation. Okay, well, let's start by just considering the very simple case where we don't have any air resistance. In that case, when we drop the ball from some height, H is going to have potential energy in the form of gravitational potential energy, MGH. It's going to lose the gravitational potential as it gets to near the floor, and it's going to gain kinetic energy. So we'll have U plus kinetic energy is equal to um, the total energy. And so if there was no air resistance and we could ignore everything that happened during the collision, this ball would just bounce up and down, up and down, up and down, constantly going up to the same height. But in reality, there's air resistance. There's little air molecules here, and there's some force, which an air resistance force, which the ball has to do work to overcome. So ball needs to do work to overcome air resistance 
and this is going to cause it to lose energy over time. It's going to be giving up some of its energy to the air molecules. So ball loses energy time. And then when it hits the ground here, the ball's compressed. There's lots of forces involved inside the ball on the molecular level, and so that's going to cause it to lose some energy as well. Ball also loses energy when it bounces. So when it bounces, some of that energy will be lost as heat. Some will be lost as sound energy. So what's going to happen is the energy is going to steadily decrease, and then when it bounces, it's going to decrease even more. So we'll have the total energy looking something like that. And then let's draw on the kinetic and potential energy. Let's let red be the kinetic energy. Initially, it's at rest. It doesn't have any kinetic energy. It's going to be going fastest just before it hits the ground here. So the kinetic energy will look something like this. And then at the top of its bounce, it's got not moving again. And so the kinetic energy will look like this. And let's draw our potential energy in blue. So it's got potential energy here, but once it bounces, it's got no height, so no gravitational potential energy. So the gravitational potential energy is going to look like this. So these two should add together to give us our total energy. So the graph would look something like that. This will be energy, and this will be time. And so we've described the energy changes going in the ball fairly thoroughly there. Problem four. Now describe the momentum of the ball changes as it bounces up and down. With reference to momentum, explain why the ball does not bounce as high on subsequent bounces as it does on the first. Make sure that you include equations in your explanation. Okay, so the momentum of the ball is changing with time. And that doesn't disobey conservation of momentum because of impulse. We know that impulse, Ft, is equal to the change in momentum. So the mass of the ball isn't changing. So this is m times the change in the velocity. So we can write that the force acting over time is equal to m delta v over delta t. And now the main force that's acting in this case is the weight force due to uh, gravity. So this is equal to mg. And so, and so we can see that the velocity is changing at a constant rate. So as the ball is traveling upwards, it's being accelerated downwards and slowing down. As it's going downwards, it's being accelerated downwards and speeding up. And so that's what's going to be going on over most of the bouncing period of the ball. When the ball hits the ground, it's going to exert a force on the ground, and the ground's going to exert an equal and opposite reaction force on the ball. And so that force is going to cause the momentum to change, and so that's how the ball will change its direction and head back upwards when it hits the ground. Now that doesn't explain why the ball loses height over time. What's going to happen there is that as the ball bounces, it has collisions with the air molecules. It gives some of its momentum to the air molecules. And so conservation of momentum tells us that the momentum of the ball must decrease a little bit that way. And so as it's losing momentum, it won't be able to get as high on subsequent bounces. Problem five. We're told that a glider A is pulled by a string across a level frictionless table. So here we have glider A pulled by a string. The string exerts a constant horizontal force. So there's some force F being exerted on this glider. Question A, part one, asks us how does the network done by the glider moving a distance 2d compared to the network done on the glider moving a distance d. 
well, we know that work is equal to f dot d. And so because this is a horizontal table and it's moving in the horizontal direction and the force is also horizontal, everything's in the same direction. So we can effectively ignore this dot product. And the force is constant. So when we apply the force over a distance d, the amount of work done is equal to fd. When we apply that same force over a distance 2d, the amount of work done is f times 2d. And so we can see that twice as much work is done when the glider moves a distance 2d rather than d. Okay, part two. Assume that the glider starts from rest. Find the ratio of the speed after the glider has moved a distance 2d to the speed of the glider after moving a distance d. Explain. Well, this work is a way of transferring energy to the glider. So this work is the increase in energy of the glider and that the glider stores its energy as kinetic energy. So the kinetic energy after it's moved a distance d is equal to fd which is equal to a half mvd squared. Now the kinetic energy after it's moved a distance 2d is equal to 2fd which is equal to a half mv2d squared. And what we need to get is the ratio v2d squared over vd. So let's call this 1, we'll call this 2, we'll do 2 over 1. And we've got a half mv2d squared over a half mvd squared, and that is equal to 2fd over fd. So now we cancel out everything that we can. These halves cancel, the m's cancel, the f's cancel, and the d's cancel. And this tells us that v2d over vd, and this is all squared, is equal to 2, which tells us that v2d over vd is equal to root 2. Part B, a string pulls a second glider, glider B, across a frictionless table. The string exerts the same force on glider B as, it, as did the string in glider A. The mass of glider B is greater than the mass of glider A. So the mass of glider B is greater than the mass of glider A. Both gliders start from rest. After each glider has been pulled a distance D, is the kinetic energy of glider A greater than, less than, or equal to the kinetic energy of glider B? Explain. Well, the kinetic energy, as we said, because they start from rest, the change in kinetic energy is the same as the work done on these gliders. Now, both of these gliders have the same force and the, they're traveling the same distance. So they have equal amounts of work done. So the work done on glider B is equal to the work done on glider A, which tells us that the change in kinetic energy of glider B is equal to the change in kinetic energy of glider A. And since they both had the same kinetic energy to start with, zero, this tells us that the kinetic energy of glider B is equal to the kinetic energy of glider A. So they have the same kinetic energy. However, as B is heavier than A, B is actually traveling slower, it's got a lower velocity, and it's going to take a longer time to travel that distance D. Problem six. In this, we're told that reflection occurs when the pulse reaches the boundary between two springs. We would like to predict whether the boundary will act more like a fixed or a free end. Part A1 says, in the situation illustrated by the photos, are the incident and reflected pulses on the same side of the spring or are they on the opposite sides of the spring? Well, we can see that it coming in, it's on top. The reflected pulse is then underneath. So those are on opposite sides of the spring. Part two. On the basis of this observation, does it appear that the reflection at the boundary is more like the reflection from a fixed end or a free end? In this case, it's more like a fixed end as this pulse has effectively undergone a phase change of 180 degrees or pi radians, which has caused it to change direction. 
Part B, which of the following quantities are different on the two sides of the boundary? Tension, tension can't change along the length of the spring, so that's the same on each side. Linear das mass density, that does change, that's mu. And the wave speed, yes, the wave speed also changes. So mu, linear. And V, the wave speed. These both change. Part two, which of the above quantities could you use to predict whether the boundary will act more like a fixed end or more like a free end? Well, the easiest one to use is the linear mass density. If we're more dense here than here, then the reflected wave will act as if it hit a fixed end. If we're less dense here than here, then the reflected wave will act like it hit a free end. So linear mass density, But the linear mass density will tell us about the speed because v is equal to the square root of t on mu. So if we were to observe the speed, we could also use that to predict if it was more like a fixed end or a free end. So linear mass density and wave speed will both tell us if it's more like a fixed end or a free end. Part 3. Describe how you could predict whether the reflected pulse will be on the same side of the string as the incident pulse or whether it will be on the opposite side. Well, like we just said, it's going to depend on the difference in the linear mass density on either side. So let's call this mu1, the linear mass density of this string, and we've got mu2 here, the linear mass density of this spring. So part three, let's assume that mu1 is greater than mu2. So in this case, this is more dense than this one. So that's like hitting a free end. So this is a free end. And this will tell us that there'll be no phase change. And so it'll be on the same side. Now if mu1 is less than mu2, so it's hitting something which is more dense, it's then like re being reflected off a fixed end and it's going to be reflected on the opposite side. or undergo a pi phase change. Part four, describe how you could predict whether the transmitted pulse will be on the same side of the spring as the incident pulse or whether it will be on the opposite side. Well, the transmitted pulse just keeps traveling. There's nothing which is going to cause it to undergo a phase change. So it will always be on the same side. And part C, imagine that a pulse on a spring is approaching a boundary. Would the boundary act more like a fixed end or more like a free end if the spring is connected to a very massive chain? Well in that case it's being reflected off something which is more dense and so it will be like a fixed end. And if it's a very light fishing line, it'll be like it's a free end. It... Now, this will be important for your work in 1B because when you get to studying optics, you're going to be looking at refractive indexes of materials. And refract another word which is sometimes used for refractive index is optical density. And so Optically dense mediums are analogous to these more dense linear materials.